minutes ago our uh, term paper topics and um, you know, it might say on the syllabus I don't remember that they're due on, in week nine but but since I also said I suspect on the syllabus that I would give you your topics two weeks in advance of the due date let's just make the due date two weeks from today which will be Tuesday week 10 okay I'm not sure if that's inconsistent with, uh, with the syllabus or not I didn't get any grading done today in fact I got very little done over the weekend um, bring in attendance sheet today uh, but um, but I did send out those term paper topics uh, so so we'll make that do on Tuesday of, of week 10 and um, and then we'll have a, a final uh, final exam we'll, we'll take advantage of that final exam period okay which will be Thursday uh, June 10th or something so we're into week 8 already we have three more weeks of this class, and then we have a week of uh, our final exam project. Um, and we're doing, uh, of course, the ecology this week. Um, I've asked you to do a little more reading, maybe. And 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 for those of you who are wondering, okay, just summarize deep ecology. Go to it. Okay, you don't need to restrict yourselves to the three essays that I've assigned you. All right, but just that's what I mean. That it says. Wait, no, I'm not asking you to summarize DB College. Are our summaries done already? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, they're done. Okay, never mind. Okay, never mind about that. All right. The last term I had people summarize DB Ecology. And anyway, all right, so now we're into DB Ecology. And, um, uh, but for our final, okay, I had, I'm glad I kind of waited because if I if had sent out something about our, uh, about our final exam project, it'll be a group project and, and it'll be a mock hearing. I mentioned before, for a model hearing, for those of you who might have done that, might have done a model United Nations hearing or something like that in high school. That sort of thing, right, is what we're going to do for our final exam. And, but I had a very, I think a good idea too, uh, let's just, let's just flash forward to the future when, when something like Christopher Stone's proposal has been adopted by a more enlightened society recognizes for either for anthropocentric consequentialist reasons or for some sort of non you know, more than anthropocentric, Rolstonian perhaps, Leopoldian reasons, an enlightened society has decided to implement um, Professor Stone's idea of guardianship for non-human natu uh, natural entities, ecological poles specifically, and we have a petitioner, so we'll need to identify a petitioner who is a petitioner for the under this guardianship proposal, which Congress recently enacted, I don't know if you guys probably don't pay that much attention to the news, but Christopher Stone's proposal was recently enacted by Congress. And uh, so now we have an opportunity, and, and, and you guys might not have heard about this either, but we, we've already got a, a guardian has been appointed for the Snake River, okay? For the Snake River watershed and all of the biotic communities that live there, and the species, the genetic lineages, the whole nine yards, right? And, and so I'm not sure who that is, but. We'll soon find out. I guess he's kind of keeping a low profile. He or she is keeping a low profile. But uh, so we're going to have a hearing, and it's going to be in front of a honorable district judge whose name escapes me right now, but he's a district judge for the Easter Federal uh, District Court of Eastern Washington, Eastern Washington District of Federal Court, whatever the hell they call themselves. Anyway, and so he's, and this is how, as far as I can tell, this is how, if we did adopt Christopher Stone's proposal for guardianship, it's how it worked. Uh, the the government the you know the level of government in this case would be the federal government because the federal government has jurisdiction over the Lower Snake River. Okay, so we have to have a hearing in front of a federal judge, all right? And the person who the petitioner is going to have a larger role to play, perhaps an organizational role, not too much larger, right? Because we don't want to have an imbalance of labor in, in this group project, right? We want to have things labor distributed fairly evenly. 
Anyway, and then that person will be in charge of putting together the environmental community's testimony in front of the Honorable Judge, what's his name, in the Eastern District of Washington, who's going to hear this. And then we'll need 10, about 10. I think we'll, have, we'll end up having about 30 people participating in this group project. Okay? It'll be held right here. I will be the Honorable Judge, whoever, uh, and I will be the guy who decides whether or not the uh, petitioners petition. And guess what, the petitioner, the guardian of the Lower Snake River, and thank goodness Congress has finally enacted this system. Now at last we have a chance to be heard. The petitioner is going straight to the heart of the matter and petitioning for asking the judge for an injunction ordering the Army Corps of Engineers to remove or breach the four Lower Snake Dams, okay? Because those four Lower Snake Dams are harming the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic communities of the, lower, of the, of the entire Snake River watershed, right? So, this petitioner who has yet to be identified, um, and I haven't done enough work to, uh, or anyway, that's what our, our final project will look like, okay? Does that sound good? Yeah. Right? So we'll do this mock hearing in front of, do we call it a trial? No, it's not a trial. It's a hearing in front of a judge, a federal judge, who has to decide whether or not to order the removal of removal or breaching of the four lower snake dams, okay? And we'll have 10 people. One person was enthusiastic about representing the uh, status quo. Who was that person? Right here. So so you want to, um, what's your name? Uh, Sorry. Corey. Corey. Do you want, so, all right, so Corey's already been identified. Yes, uh, and I need to get all this together, but, and, and Corey will need about nine other people on his team, all right? And the way I envision it, Okay, those of you who are keeping score and wondering where these arguments are coming from, um, feel free, don't, don't let me pin you down and say this is where the, the pro-establishment, pro-hydropower system, keep the dams in place point of view is coming from. You guys need to be creative, you know, I mean, who knows? But as far as I can tell, okay, you're gonna have a consultant working for the uh, Center for the Defense of Free Enterprise. Our good buddy Ron Arnold's, your good buddy Ron Arnold's organization, right? The wise user. So we're going to have one consultant who works for a six-figure salary guy. Obviously, this is his gravy train, and he and he and he's consulting you and your group from a wise use perspective. And then you're also going to have another consultant who's consulting you from the group A, the group A. As far as I can tell, and don't and don't let me pin you. And then you're going to have a lot of leeway to identify sort of at-large community members, you know, the job, you know, the single mother who needs a job, et cetera, all these, you know, various characters you can bring to bear right. to testify at your hearing as to why this idea is a terrible idea. Awesome. Okay? Um, and, and, but, but basically, you know, you, philosophically, your group will be, you know, have some leeway, but you'll also have to cover the wise use arguments, right. and you'll have to cover the group A arguments, which are largely economic. And, and Baxter, of course, is your biggest friend. Right, and then the, the the larger group, I think it's it's best to have the environmental community be somewhat larger. Okay, it might seem unfair to be outnumbered like that, but just because I think you know the material we've covered is more complex on the environmental community side. Right, basically, I like the final project to not be in, not not be entirely a little bit comprehensive. Draw on the material we've covered early in the term. But I do like to emphasize social ecology and deep ecology, all right, for the final project. All right, and that's convenient too because the social ecologists are conveniently categorized among the anthropocentric environmental community, okay? All right, the social ecology, we, we cover that next week. And the deep ecologists, real quick, side point, side note, where do the deep ecologists belong on my natural resource values wheel? Think of it as a clock. Where do they belong? 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock? Anybody? 10 or 11. Okay, very good. So you would identify the deep ecologists on the face of it appear to be, and this is probably you're on the right track, appear to be neo, some, some kind of neo-Kantian, you know, there's... Nas himself was a spinocist, right? Spinoza's Spinoz much, you know, 200 years before Kant, or 100 years before Kant. So it's kind of a stretch, you know, to say Nas himself was a Kantian. But in general, when it comes to 
the meta-ethical position that they tend to identify with. It would, and the normative theory that they tend to identify with is a, is a non-consequentialist normative theory and the axiological orientation they tend to identify, the deep ecologists tend to identify with is a holistic more than anthropocentric. And, and so that combined with the non-consequentialism, yes, they appear to be right up there with Rolston, right? Rolston kind of captures, in a way, this deep ecology argument without even wanting to, without even intending to, right? Um, so anyway, that's where they belong, right? The deep ecologists. And the, so the deep ecologists are more than anthropologists. So that's convenient, right? To have one group in the final project uh, to, to divide the, the environmental community. It's going to be giving testimony, right? All of you people are going to, in the environmental community side of the final project, are going to be giving, to, not all of you, right? You don't all have to speak. You all have to help prepare and go to group meetings and prepare and contribute, right? But you don't all have to speak, right? You have to designate certain key people to speak. And those key people are going to summarize the arguments that you as a group come up with, right? The group, and the group being divided into the, the more than anthropocentric environmental community, and then the more familiar anthropocentric environmental community. The social ecologists, for the most part, are part of the anthro, right? Anthropocent with Norton and with Wilson and those guys. And then the deep ecologists are part of the more than anthropocentric environmental community with Rolston and the neo and, and all the, all the, the the ecocentric Leopoldians, right? Okay, so that's how it's going to work. Um, so I guess we need to we've identified Corey as our um, establishment leader, shall we say? And we need still need to identify. So what do you think? Um, so this is our final exam project. I've sent out the essay uh, questions already. So I think I think I can work on this today and tomorrow, and then uh, come up with something more definite by Thursday. And then we can start identifying people because I'd like you to start you know knowing who's in your group, so you can start getting together if you want, right? Sooner rather than later. Okay? Does that sound reasonable? And then maybe even this coming weekend, those of you who want, who you know, are ambitious and want to get started on this can have a preliminary meeting, right? And then I would, I, the way I envision it is that, you know, there'll be two teams generally, right? The dam removal, the petitioning team, right, which is the dam removal team, and then the uh, respondent, right, that's what they'll be called, the respondent team, and that'll be the uh, keep the dams in place team, right? And so you'll have broad, big meetings, you know, where the two teams, you know, the team A, team, you know, the envir environmental team meets all together. But then you'll also have smaller group meetings where, you know, the anthro environmentalists will meet. And then, and then the, you see, that's kind of how I envision it happening. And then you'll coordinate, and then we'll basically, we'll treat ourselves as different elements of a group mind. Okay, each person will play a different role, and then the, the, the general result that we're aiming toward is a comprehensive argument. Two, two sets of comprehensive arguments, right? One against dam removal, and one in favor of dam removal. Okay? And, and all these different, right? You guys have to collaborate and put all these different puzzle pieces together. Okay? All right, so I think I've hopefully I've said enough about our final exam project. And remember, for, our, for your term paper, which is now due the Tuesday of week 10, okay? Did I start that? Hang on a second. For your term paper, um, you can write on a topic of your own choosing, okay? Yeah, you got that going. All right, good. You can, you can write on a topic of your own choosing. Just make sure you run past me first, okay? Uh, to make sure you're philosophically on track. Is that Wait, you sent out a list of topics or your paper? Are you talking about the final final paper? And then in terms of those people who want to do a written final exam, I haven't sent that out yet. Oh, okay. No. I've only sent out term paper topics. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we have a final paper and then we have the project. It, let's just call it a term paper. Okay, term paper. Which is due Tuesday of week 10. And then there's the project or a written project. That is correct. Okay. The, written, the written final exam for the, I, I expect in the class of 45 students, I expect that about 15 of you will want to do the written for various reasons. Some of you just insist, you know, you want to do the written because that's how you organize, that's how you think, that's how you get your thoughts, you know, this has been a very challenging class and you want that 
to, to bring it all together, right? That's obviously perfectly understandable. Other people, maybe in the back of their mind, they just kind of want to be done earlier and not wait around until Thursday of finals week, right? So for various reasons, people will choose the written option. And uh, I will send that out separately, okay? Um, anyway, uh, I guess I should send that. And basically, you can expect uh, something very similar to the midterm, to the take-home midterm exam, a moral struggle presented to you in which you are asked to uh, construct the social ecology argument, okay? Or the deep ecology argument, okay? Because again, for the final exam, I like to, to uh, be a little bit comprehensive, but draw more on the, the material we cover in the latter part of the course. In the latter part of the course, we kind of focus on this tension and disagreement and debate between social ecologists and deep ecologists. Okay, so for the final exam, that's kind of what I want you to emphasize. Right? But the format will be just like the midterms. Right? Um, so any other questions about this uh, procedural administrative stuff? All right. So, uh, this is kind of where we left off last term, perhaps. Um, um, wilderness preservation, even, even species preservation in isolation from preserving habitat and all the things that, you know, tie a species to its landscape. Uh, what were the emphasis, right? Wilderness preservation was the emphasis of 20th century environmentalism. And perhaps Historically, we could say the golden age of, if, you know, if we want to think that way, it was kind of this beautiful age of, of 20th century North American environmentalism, where Congress got a lot of work done, you know, environmental work, uh, protecting wilderness, and uh, yeah. Do you want the music still playing? No, I don't think or? I do. I don't know why it's, it seems to have shifted to some other kind of a classical or Chopin. All right, but enough of that. Also. Um, uh, where was I? Anyway, you know, maybe I, you know, if I was to put a period on this, I'd say I don't know, 1912, with, with, with the Raker Act was the congressional, uh, the law, the bill that Congress passed in 1912 after extremely contentious hearings regarding Yosemite and Hetch Hetchy. Um, uh, so that, you know, that was the first big defeat, right? That was kind of the beginning of, of, of North America, 20th century North American environmentalism. And, um, and then a lot of work got done, though, between 1912 and 1964. The Wilderness Act passes in 1964, which results in setting aside just hundreds of millions of acres of, of land uh, for wilderness protection. Um, and then the Endangered Species Act is passed in 1972. Uh, a series of other federal environmental acts, environmental, uh, the, the law that requires uh, um, environmental impact statements, for example, uh, a whole series of laws passed by Congress in the 60s and 70s. And then meanwhile, in, in academically, right, we have Leopold working in the 1940s. I mean, you know, finally putting together his mature work as, and his, his, his analysis of how we ought to, our moral obligations to ecological holes, right? He's putting that together in the 1940s. And his ideas are taken up, as we noticed, by even by the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, William O. Douglas quotes him in his dissenting <coughs> opinion, right? Um, in any event, a lot of amazing things are happening, right? But by the end of the 20th century, it appears that that, that, you know, that that approach to environmental ethics and environmentalism is kind of winding its way to an end. And environmentalism is beginning to look for uh, new theories, new justifications, new explanations, new projects to undertake. You know, and, and, and in many ways, wilderness preservation is starting to be viewed as not part of the problem really, but, but, but an emphasis on wilderness preservation to the exclusion of 
the, bound, the, 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 the environment immediately around us, the exclusion of uh, urban landscapes and rural landscapes, this idea that we should focus on pristine areas, untrammeled by man, uh, begins to be, become a bit suspicious. And so environmental pragmatism and Anthony Weston and deep ecology and ecofeminism and social ecology, these movements are all arguing that we need to start focusing on the nature that's right around us. All right? Um, my favorite example is the salmon populations that swim right through our city. Uh, we used to have lower Columbia, lower Willamette salmon runs that used to spawn right over here, right in the middle of our city. And uh, it wouldn't be that hard to create conditions that might invite them to return and resume doing that. Right? And that's the sort of environmental project that a 21st century environmentalist is more interested in. Right? Um, sort of reconnect, not sort of, but really the heart of the project is reconnecting nature and culture. Whereas the focus on wilderness had the unfortunate tendency of emphasizing the separation between culture and nature. Right? Right? Untrammeled by man means the opposite of culture. Right? Wild. Right? And, that, and the unfo one unfortunate consequence of thinking that way is, is the dichotomy that, that gives rise to the idea that nature is just a, a set of, pro you know, just nothing but property for us to exploit, is, un you know, is, is, is uh, underscored, right, and reinforced. So that's a big problem, and that's a problem that deep ecologists are pointing to, um, and all these other groups. All right, all these other the various different environmental ethical orientations are observing that the, uh, the, the problem underlying many environmental crises is the sense that human beings are, sep are not natural, are somehow separate from nature. So all of these Cartesian, right, you might have, heard, might have heard this word, these Cartesian dualisms are contributing in a really big way to our environmental crisis. And they need to be challenged, right? Not just policies, but the thinking that underlines those policies needs to be challenged. Okay? So Arne Noss is a Norwegian philosopher who happens to be very interested in outdoor recreation. Okay? It sounds familiar, right? It sounds like our environmentalists. And it's a common story throughout the West, really. A lot of the environmentalists and environmental philosophy originates with, with thinkers who originally were inspired because they just love to spend a lot of time outside. And Arne Noss is no exception. He's actually a renowned mountain climber and was famous for that in itself. He's this kind of a hero, a hero in Norway for his mountain climbing prowess when he was a younger man. But he also happened to be a philosophy professor, in fact, the, the youngest tenured philosophy professor in the history of Norway. He was given a tenure track job, I think, at the age of 26. And uh, was an, largely what, probably what I would call an analytic philosopher. Um, but he was also, maybe that's unfair, but he was, a, he was also deeply inspired by the work of uh, Benedict Spinoza, who was a uh, great Western philosopher. You've heard of him. That Benedict Spinoza is sort of a contemporary of Descartes, roughly a contemporary, I think a little bit younger. Yeah, he actually considerably younger. And he responded to, the, to Cartesian metaphysics and, and offered his own very, very different understanding. And, and Descartes, uh, Descartes was a dualist, right, who believed that there are two fundamental substances, mind and matter, right, mind and body. And Spinoza said, no, there's only one fundamental. Anyway, we don't need to get too heavy into Spinoza, but Spinoza is a very interesting figure. And this Arne Nas is drawing philosophically on Spinoza to construct a <coughs> Not all, right to construct his deep ecology, right? Because when he's when deep ecology is the recognition that sound environmental management is not only you know a matter of of uh, uh, right of applying certain practical principles, but it's also a matter of understanding metaphysically the relationship, the true nature of the relationship between humankind and the natural world. All right, um, and so adherents of the deep ecology movement share a dislike of the human-centered value system at the core. This goes way back, right? I mean, Socrates himself, going all the way back to the beginning of written Western philosophy, 
Well, I should say that because there are some pre-Socratics who wrote stuff down too. There are fragments that have survived from the pre-Socratics. But anyway, it seems that Socrates was inveterately and almost incorrigibly anthropocentric. And he bequeathed this orientation throughout the whole history, with a few exceptions here and there. All right? Um, all right, deep ecologists argue that environmental philosophy must recognize the values that adhere objectively in nature, independently of human wants, needs, or desires. All right, and then there's just a whole bunch of very diverse um, sources of the deep ecology movement. All right, and we really need to separate out the deep ecology, uh, cu the cultural movement of deep ecology from the philosophical, from the articulation of, of the philosophy of deep ecology by philosophers like Arne Nas and George Sessions. Sessions and Duval, Bill Duval and George Sessions have written quite a bit together. Uh, I believe they were colleagues at uh, California State University, one of those California State University uh, schools and, uh, but Duval is the sociologist and Sessions is the philosopher. And, um, but culturally, deep ecology is incredibly diverse and um, made of a mishmash of different ideas and inspirations, some of which don't even, aren't even compatible with each other. All right? Philosophically, uh, that last claim I made about elements of deep ecology not being compatible, Probably the best expression of that at, 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 the, at a big level, at a, at, a, you know, at a very broad level, is uh, the deep ecologist tendency to somehow want to simultaneously identify with um, biocentric egalitarianism and holistic uh, and, and, and metaphysical holism. All right, so they want to both be biocentrists who are individualists, right? And they want to be holists who are not individualists. Like, uh, so anyway, there's this tension philosophically in deep ecology, um, but at a cultural level, who, right, you might say, who cares? I mean, it's, it's a movement and they're still trying to work things out and there are obviously gonna be lots of tensions, philosophical tensions in any kind of political movement. You know, they're always going to be strange bedfellows, right? So anyway, it's interesting to note, though, the, the vast array of different influences that have gone into the deep ecology movement. It's also interesting to note how just the, the two words put together, they, they're kind of attractive. And if you go to a, like a radical environmentalist conference or something, and you, try, and you explain to people that you're a, a, a social ecologist, maybe, or, or even more bizarrely, you're a, an environmental pragmatist, People are not going to know what you're talking about, but if you say that you're a deep ecologist, or if you say you're an ecofeminist, then people are going to know what you're talking about, right? And because it just, the term has resonated culturally in a way that terms like environmental pragmatism or environmental virtue ethics have not, right? Um, so that's always something to keep in mind. Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, and, and we don't need to demand philosophical rigor. Right? As philosophers, we kind of like that. We like you know, things to be consistent. We like the metaphysics to line up with you know, the policy and everything. But, you know, but there's another sense in which, well, this is a very young movement. And you know, there are going to be all these wild elements in the movement. And we shouldn't go around saying that you know, well, these people are philosophically inconsistent or something. So anyway, um, and probably deep ecology has done more to influence culture. Then you know, self-described deep ecologists have probably done more to influence Western culture than any of the other kind of uh, philosophical traditions we've looked at. Okay, um, and it's because it, it, it emerged at this during this ferment, this cultural ferment of the late '60s and early '70s, right, with the counterculture and uh, a lot of radical political movements. Um, so. But anyway, you'll find you know, all these different things mixed in, including uh, efforts to draw from Eastern religions, okay? 
F Buddhism primarily, efforts to draw from indigenous spiritual traditions, Native American traditions, right? Uh, and then efforts to draw from pagan, not only draw from, but perhaps reconstruct pagan traditions. Um, a whole mishmash, you know, of different new agey kind of tendencies are found in the deep ecology movement. All right. Um, so, in one sense, I'm not sure if this is really that fair, but one, one thing that could be said is that deep ecology might be said to represent the psychologization of environmental philosophy um, in the sense that it, the deep ecologists are calling for a raising of consciousness. They're not necessarily, you know, trying to promote uh, a morally right resource policy, okay? They're trying to elevate dialogue in Western culture. Um, okay, understanding deep ecology in its academic sense requires the reading at least the work of these four, right? But we're going to read a little bit of Arnie Noss for Thursday, and then we're going to also read uh, Warwick Fox's, just an extra, just part, of, a very short and kind of written for a popular audience by Warwick Fox. Warwick Fox has kind of gone beyond, he no longer describes himself as a deep ecologist, but um, he's probably the most uh, gifted and talented uh, philosophers in, in the deep ecology movement. He's still very active, so. And I've never read that in this class before, so I'm looking forward to talking about that on Thursday, about Professor Fox's work. Um, Okay, so the word first emerged, first appeared, deep ecology first appeared in this 1973 <coughs> English language article, which I believe I've asked you to read for Thursday. Okay, um, Nas faults European and North American civilization for the arrogance of its human-centered instrumentalization of non-human nature. A lot of this is going to sound very familiar. And it's kind of cool that we've already done all this philosophical work, and now we're, we're, you know, we're prepared to understand deep ecology much better than we were at the beginning of the term. Um, right? And, and there's a strong sense in which a lot of the work that, that, that Arnie Noss and deep ecology tries to accomplish was already tried to accomplish by Uncle Aldo, right? Uncle Aldo already did a lot of this work, you know, in his own amateurish kind of way. But, uh, right? Group A conservationists are the shallow ecologists. Group B conservationists are the deep ecologists, right? Go reread that section of the land ethic and you'll see the remarkable foreshadowing in Leopold's A.B. Cleavage, uh, anticipating the deep ecology movement. Um, all right. Um, NAS means a cosmology, right? By ecology movement, he doesn't just mean doing the right thing by nature, right? Treating land, air, water, wildlife moral, in a morally responsible way. He means adopting a whole world view that is personally fundamental.